I am going to give you a talk on CBDC, which is maybe not something you expected from a blockchain conference. Um, but I really want to touch on some points that have been illustrated in some of the previous fantastic talks, um, that blockchain is a foundation, um, and we build applications on blockchain. And in my view, blockchain is the correct foundation for quite a few CBDC initiatives that could be developed in the coming years. So the way this talk is going to proceed, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of context on where this talk is coming from. Then I'm going to give you some case studies in a CBDC from around the world. It's very much a technology that's in development at the moment, but there are a lot of drives from a lot of powerful players to further this technology. And I'll just give you a few illustrative examples of those. Then I'm going to give you end change thoughts on how CBDC could look, the architectures that we're playing with, and why we believe that blockchain is the right foundation for it. And then I will wrap it up with some concluding thoughts. Hello. OK, so now I'm going to actually introduce myself. Um, I'm Gareth Menchain. Um, and I want to thank you all for welcoming us to the Philippines and Bataan. Um, I've only really been here for a few days, but I've already been struck by the beauty of this natural land. Um, it reminds me of, of my um, home country, Great Britain. Um, a lot of rain um, and a very lush, but you definitely have better temperature here. So um, it's, it's a bit of an improvement um, on that. Um, and the other thing I was struck by is the forward-thinking nature of the people here. You're fantastic. Um, I, love, I love the way that you're considering what should come next. In a lot of places I've been, people obviously think about what should come next, but they don't actively reach out and engage with it the way that the people of the Philippines and Bataan seem to be, so it's awesome. Um, the other thing I was struck by um, was a request to do a talk here um, yesterday. So I had a quick think about it and I thought I would speak about CBDC as it's a topic close to my heart. Um, so it's a pleasure to be allowed to engage with the distinguished audience we have here. Um, and so I will proceed with this talk. Oh, and finally, I just want to give a shout out to the art at the back. I really liked the owl person piece, so the, well done art project. Your work is really awesome. Um, okay, cool. So, oh, and Shane, about us. Um, we're headquartered in Azuk, Switzerland. Um, we've got a few offices um, in Europe. We have reach beyond Europe um, as well. Um, we're quite contactable uh, by, via our website, so please feel free to reach out if you want to. We have 200 engineers, many more other brilliant supportive employees, um, and we actually have a thousand plus research papers um, which cover a, a wide range of um, intellectual property that potentially you guys can you know, talk to us about and use to empower your own products. Okay, so CBDC, what is it? Central Bank Digital Currency. Um, I think it was quite interesting um, because I've heard this mentioned a few times already at this conference, so I'm glad some people have teed me up. Um, it's a very big topic. Um, I'm just gonna give you a bit of an intro, a bit of a high-level primer. Um, if anyone's interested in delving into more things, I have resources that I can recommend Please just grab me wherever I am. Like I'll happily direct you and talk your ear off about the topic. Okay, so why did I decide to talk to you about it? Well, if you look at this uh, Google Trends uh, graph that I pulled, um, it's a conversation topic that has actually been spoken about for a long time. But since 2020, um, it's actually significantly increased and it continues to significantly increase. But what is CBDC um, is the question. Before I go into that, I just want to introduce you to some concepts that you kind of need to get a basic grasp on to have this conversation. And this is traditional money, because CBDC operates in the traditional money space. So the types of traditional money that exist are cash, which is issued by governments and is fantastic because it's always available. If you have cash, you can spend that cash. It's guaranteed by your government. There is bank deposit money, which is Great because it's an electronic format that lets you engage with all kinds of fantastic online services. Um, it's generally created when banks give you loans. Um, and that's fine most of the time, but occasionally it leads to situations like the 2008 financial crash, when you'll actually find that bank money is not necessarily available to you because it's actually a liability. And in financial disasters, they can't necessarily 
guarantee you access to it. It's a rare condition, but it is a problem when it becomes a problem. The final type of money that exists is one you may not have encountered, um, and it's central bank money. Um, so this is electronic money that is in fact guaranteed by the central bank and the government. It will always be available. Um, okay, so what is CBDC? Okay, well, the Bank of International Settlements says that CBDC is not a well-defined term. It's not very helpful for my presentation. Um, they do concede that it's uh, used to refer to a few things. Generally, it's a new form of central bank money. That is a type of central bank money that is a uh, digital liability um, of the central bank. And what that kind of means in human terms is the government can issue an electronic token to you, which is backed in the same way that physical cash is backed, um, which means it is guaranteed. We can kind of see the cross-section of types of money, and we actually see that central bank digital currency is able to have all the positive qualities of electronic money, um, that it can be used for things like micropayments, it, uh, online service payments. It's always available to you, like cash, and its usage, its usage is um, guaranteed to you, like cash. CBDC basically can have all the positives of all the types of money. Okay, but what I've been saying is ambiguous, and I'm probably going to make it even more ambiguous now because I'm going to talk about what people are asking to do with CBDC. What are the use cases? This is just some of them. If you go online, there are an awful lot of things people would like to do with CBDC. They want to do financial inclusion. There are a lot of unbanked people in the world, um, and CBDC, given that it's an electronic token, can be held by people without bank accounts and used for digital payments, unlike cash. So it's to bring people into financial inclusion and allow them to use contemporary services. Um, some people think that uh, transparency um, in financial uh, practices, um, having everything kind of digitally recorded and secure, will, would actually be very positive um, because it would lead to investor confidence. Um, and that obviously can be done with kind of unified banking systems. Um, it's a great response to global challenges. We, sh we saw during the pandemic, um, obviously, the challenges of the unbanked being able to um, use money and not uh, ex risk exposure um, to the coronavirus. Uh, that's just an instance of a CBDC responding to global challenges. Um, it's an interesting topic for the resilience of the economy. Um, and why that is, is private money is, is a fantastic um, innovation and it's a great challenger and it's got much utility. But the benefit of publicly issued money is it can be used to implement government policy to maintain economic resilience. Um, and that's something that I think most central banks and most governments and we as people shouldn't want to lose. We should welcome challenging the challenges and the private money, but we should, we should be sure to maintain the capability to retain economic stability. That wasn't meant to rhyme, but it did. Um, so the other kind of things are Innovation, um, effectively, if you had a programmable layer of money, um, it would make financial services less inaccessible um, and allow kind of smaller startups um, to provide services on a kind of unified kind of API layer of money. Um, you could also use it to improve your payment process. We all know that tokens move between banks are atomic and instantaneous, um, which is really good for remittances. And I know that's a relevant topic um, in the Philippines. Um, but basically, you can make your payment processes a lot quicker, a lot cheaper, and in general, less exposed to FX fluctuations if you were to use tokenized money. Um, they also are interested in maintaining privacy, um, which may seem contrary, but um, one of the other benefits of physical cash is that it's a quite a private me mechanism, um, and people who want to implement CBDC have that considered as a value? Can we maintain the privacy of users while giving them access to electronic services? Um, and finally, as the gentleman to me earlier to me alluded, um, some governments are very interested in taxation and using CBDC and electronic money to move transactions out of informal economies um, into formal economies where taxation can be collected. I am not making political statements in this talk. It's a thing that people ask for, however. So, Hopefully I've confused you, because that was my goal. There are a lot of things you could do with CBDC. Um, and this lovely pictorial representation um, is meant to evoke that feeling of where are we going, given this list of different things. I have another nice visual piece. Um, and what this kind of talks to is, you could design many different systems, but if you don't know what your goal is with a central bank digital currency, 
you might build the wrong system and then it won't give you the outcome you want. So, moving on to case studies, these are things that people are actually doing with CBDC at this point. So, the Reichsbank in Sweden has noticed the decline in the use of cash um, and they've also noticed the normalization um, of a requirement for digital, uh, instantaneous digital payment. So their experiments look to ensure there's always a public form of money, a public alternative um, to allow people to spend. And that's really to meet that requirement of economic stability to make sure that public money that can be affected by the government is always available. Project Helvetia in Switzerland, um, this is completely different. This is about interbank settlements and remittance. They basically linked a number of banks together. Um, they've to basically tokenized um, the money that's being moved between the banks. So there's a backing, it's effectively a stable coin, um, but these banks all agree to use. And they're able to settle with each other instantaneously, even more efficiently than their RTGS, their, their real-time gross settlement systems. Um, uh, and they're also seeing big improvements in remittance processes run in this way. I want to reiterate though, this is just an experiment, but they have proven that utility. And again, I know it's one that's key to this area. The sand dollar in the Bahamas, which is um, actually really close to my heart because it's one of the first CBDCs that's actually gone live. Um, and the sand dollar is all about allowing access to an unbanked population with geographic challenges, i.e. they live on an archipelago, to have access to cash electronically and spend it without having to take a boat to a bank. Um, so, those are three different case studies, and the thing I want to conclude again is, they're all completely different. Like, everybody is doing something different with their CBDCs. Um, and there are many, many more examples of CBDC projects um, out there in the world. This map uh, is tracking the status of CBDC research. Um, and as you can see, most countries are either researching, developing, or piloting a CBDC. Um, there are a couple of launches. Bahamas is the main one. I know that the Chinese one is quite advanced, although it's not launched. Um, and the Nigerian one was launched, but they, uh, there have been some challenges with it because it required users to have a bank account, which never solved the problems of financial inclusion. So that's been a bumpy launch. Okay, so that's my brief, extremely high-level introduction to CBDCs and how there are a vast array of requirements that people want to uh, fulfill with them. What I want to kind of conjure up with this one is, if a country goes on the CBDC journey, can they be helped um, in that journey? Um, we have actually produced quite a detailed playbook that goes into a lot more detail with a lot more substantiation than I just have. Um, and this is a free download. You can uh, request it via LinkedIn. Um, and it will really just talk about this area. So if there's anyone who's interested in the topic or any central bankers who are interested in just learning a bit more, feel free to download our playbook. Um, it, it's, it's, it's well produced. I, I will say it is well produced and worth a read. Okay, so to go to the second half of my chat, um, which may be quite a lot faster than the first, um, is why we think that Bitcoin should be the foundational layer to a CBDC. So, the quote, to establish money, you need to have a system that everyone can trust and agree upon. Um, that line was more or less said in one of the talks yesterday, um, and it is similar to the Byzantine general problem. Um, and the question really is, if you have a vast array of actors on a financial network, how do you create a shared sense of state, an agreement on everybody's position? And I think at this point, for many people in the room, I could stop talking because you know that I'm going to basically go to distributed ledger technology and blockchain to be the solution to it. The title of the presentation is a spoiler, and I think you all know that it's the best solution we have to this challenge. So we've got this, the Byzantine general's problem, we've got the many actors, how do they agree? And what are the other kind of core requirements? Well, as we've discussed, they can be many and varied, but the Bank of International Settlements um, has specified in, in agreement with several other kind of influential central banks that CBDCs should continue to provide access to central bank money because it is a guaranteed asset effectively. They should continue to provide um, financial resilience. They should give people access to more payment methods. So give people without banking access to online electronic payment. They should encourage inclusion. They should improve cross-border payments for the reasons I described earlier because they are slow and they could be much faster. Um, they should continue to ensure public privacy 
Um, and they, of course, as a requirement for a banking system, should facilitate fiscal transfers. So what, what can solve all of these problems? Um, we think Bitcoin is the answer. We think Bitcoin should be the lowest layer. It, it solved the, um, the, the Byzantine general problem. We know it has. It's been proven to do so for a long time. Um, it solves many other problems as well um, with its data integrity um, and security aspects. Um, we know for a fact that you can solve disputes on the blockchain by looking back at the immutable history of it. And in this one, I simply run through those requirements and described how Bitcoin and the blockchain effectively ensure each of those CBDC requirements is met. I think one of the most important points is in CBDC, the token should be holdable by banks or individuals equally, and Bitcoin and blockchain provide the method by which individuals can hold those tokens without an account custodian. I think that's one of the single biggest points. Um, the blockchain network is extremely resilient. Um, it has not gone down over the last 11 years. Um, it obviously allows for the various other requirements like increased payment diversity um, and financial inclusion for the similar reasons we've talked about earlier. It gives people, individuals, without bank accounts, access to electronic um, payments and it can be used for improving cross-border payments because when you have a variety of organizations that need to agree on a complex operation, such as a cross-border remittance, something like a blockchain, a single source of truth that they can all look to is a requirement for that. Okay, and just before I wrap up, I kind of want to describe the architecture that we've been toying with for a CBDC at Enchain. We basically have the central bank issuing the tokens, much in the same way that they issue money today. Um, they can distribute those via a, via a variety of business processes to individuals, to banks, um, or new innovative processes. You know, there could be state relief given directly to individuals. Um, either way, institutions and people can hold and transact CBDC equally, and those architectures should be completely interoperable. You should effectively be able to pay CBDC coins in your wallet into your bank if you have one, and your bank account will be credited. And finally, everything that is done is logged on the blockchain, so it becomes immutable, and there is no dispute. Um, and this, um, this leads to the kind of final point I want to make, which is our mission statement. We want to create a more inclusive, efficient, resilient, and diverse payment system focusing on the privacy of individuals. These are the requirements that Enchain has identified of CBDCs. We want to provide those things, and we believe that blockchain is a foundational layer to them. So, I guess as my final thought, I want to conclude that there are a variety of policy objectives that CBDCs could meet. And as a result of that, there are a variety of design choices you could take. Um, it's very important to be clear with your requirements to get the correct build. Um, the one thing though we position as an organization is, in order to solve the problem of having an extremely complicated financial state that potentially millions of actors need to agree upon, we think that blockchain is the right foundation for that technology. And I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to listen to probably quite a technical subject, but it's one that I spend a lot of time thinking about. So thank you very much for your time, guys. And Thank you for hosting this fantastic conference. I've learned a lot and I hope I continue to do so.